Hello and welcome to the European Parliament. My name is Catherine Fior and I'm delighted to welcome Mafalda Duarte from the Climate Investment Fund and Paul Tang, uh, Social and Democrat M MEP and uh, a stalwart now in the Parliament of the Economic and Monetary Affairs Committee, yep. right. an expert on disclosure in particular. Yep. So uh, Mafalda, can you tell us a little bit about the Climate Investment Fund? How long has it been going and how is it working? Thank you very much for having me here. A pleasure being with MEP people. Uh, so the Climate Investment Funds are one of the largest multilateral climate funds globally. Um, we were set up in 2008 at the time of the financial crisis and when we were still lagging a bit behind on the international climate change negotiations to uh, support developing countries make difficult investment decisions towards clean energy, climate resilient investments. Um, so right now, after 11 years, uh, we have more than 300 programs in 72 developing countries uh, across the board, renewable energy, energy efficiency, sustainable transport, water management, agriculture, coastal zone management. So we have a very diversified range of investments um, in 72 developing countries. Um, and. And I'm proud to say that, uh, you know, we have very good results to show based on, you know, leadership and sound partnerships and a sound business model. Paul, uh, Ursula von der Leyen, start of a new commission, yeah. a parliament that has declared climate emergency. Are sustainable investment funds, you know, what do you anticipate from it? How will it work? Um, well, let's say that clearly say there is an emergency. There's no time left, almost no time left, uh, to not collide with the iceberg, but just go, just avoid it. So this is the, the problem. So we need to ch really start now. We're almost too late. So that's, that's the emergency. And therefore, you need, uh, you need investment, investment in a sustainable economy. And that's rather new. And we are, we are, we are at the start. So therefore, we need uh, public money, uh, this is one of the difficult issues always, but I really think and I hope that the new commission will uh, come with uh, proposals to, for fresh public money. Look at the budgetary rules, for example. Do we, do we need an investment rule or a sustainable investment rule? It's a difficult one. What, we, what I certainly will, uh, will see is that there will be a, a call for um, initiatives like uh, CIF, uh, but also at a European level, the European Investment Bank becomes a climate investment bank, uh, making sure that we also invest ourselves in uh, well, clean and sustainable energy. So this is what. Uh, but, but will there be uh, will be enough? No, I also think we need sometimes regulations mm -hmm. to uh, to make sure that uh, uh, that indeed the, the new technologies uh, uh, come about. Um, but also need to, for example. Um, uh, abolish subs uh, subsidies on fossil fuels. We always want that. Well, now it's time to do it, right? Yes. So, Mafalda, are, are, are you, do you have the same ch um, challenges when you look at countries and how they invest? Can you persuade them to look at the long term and see the value yes. of investing in this? I mean, that has been the very positive and, uh, you know, and quite touching experience that you know I've had and we've had with the climate investment funds because in the middle of a very difficult economic financial context with you know with the sufficient scale of public resources at the right terms so with the right level of concessionality the, the these countries these developing countries made these investment choices um, and so, you know, what we see across these 72 countries is countries making first of its kind investments in geothermal power, in solar, PV and so concentrated solar power, in sustainable transport. And they made these investment decisions. They, we also supported them putting in place the, the regulatory frameworks because these are important, the policies and the strategies and the regulatory frameworks. And then we supported them with the investments. 
and give it, to give comfort to both the government as an investor in many countries, but the private sector. The private sector here means the private sector developers, operators, but also the commercial banks in, in those countries to become involved. I mean, there's been a lot of discussion at a European level about taxonomies and you're thinking, well, where is this discussion going? Um, how important is it to set the rules about what an green investment is from the outset and and you know is it important to get that private investment in yeah i, I think it's indispensable it's, you can't do without so to say so I, I emphasize the role of the public sector and public money but it should be followed by by private money and private investment this is so you need to change the system it can't be done only with uh, uh, with public money but you need private investment as well and then comes the issue how to make sure that investment is indeed sustainable uh, and when I say sustainable it's not just green we can't produce batteries for electric cars with child labor we can't have, uh, let's say, windmills produced with underpaid, uh, underpaid workers. So that would be not. I would, that would damage sustainability. And uh, so it should be a just transition is the the, the buzzword here. Well, this this applied. That's how I see sustainability. Now, to make sure that it is sustainable, um, financial institutions, but then later on also the corporates need to disclose what they do, what the impact is of their investments on uh, on people and planet. Uh, but they also want to have clarity on what, what for example, green is, or what, uh, what is the effect on climate change, what is the effect on biodiversity, the water quality. And this is what you do in taxonomy. You standardize, in a sense, the disclosure so that investors know what is sustainable and what isn't. If you want to have to change in this portfolio away from the brown, dirty assets toward the green, shiny assets, that's what you need to, uh, need to do. This, we hear this a lot, especially after uh, some of the, the changes that were introduced in France and had uh, to fuel tax that it had a very violent response. You have to have a, trans, a just transition for all. Have you come across that in your work? At, is that an issue in developing countries as well? Oh, no, absolutely. I mean, I, I don't think we can tackle the climate crisis if we don't think about social justice and climate justice and, and social inequities, you know, they, they are necessarily linked because, you know, what we are looking at are very profound transformations in the sectors as we know them, energy, transport, water, agriculture. We are looking at profound transformations. And if, if we leave segments of the society behind, you know, of course, they will not support this transition, and we need this transition. But yeah. we do need to ensure that it's done in a in a social, socially just, and, just and, and way. That's not always easy. Give me one example. Uh, uh, one and a half week ago, there was a publication on an investment that involved the Dutch develop, uh, development bank, palm uh, palm oil in Gong, in Congo. It was found that it was involved land grabbing, disowning the community. Workers were underpaid, were exposed to pesticides, and the drink water was polluted. Mm. Just showing uh, that good intentions don't don't count in the end. Yeah. It's also what is the result. And sometimes investing in difficult uh, circumstances leads to difficult uh, uh, difficult situations. But Europe has to put its own house in order, but. Uh, when we, when we look at Europe's relationship with the rest of the world, can it exercise pressure, should it exercise pressure on, say, countries that are, use a lot of coal, use a lot of dirty fuels? I mean, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't necessarily use the word pressure, but I would, and based on our own experience, I think with, the, with sound partnerships, in fact, you know, institutions coming and working more and more together towards the same goals that the, in, the, in these countries and making sure that, you know, we are providing the support that is needed to the developing countries because, you know, let, let's face it, they have in difficult investment choices to make. They, they, they have to use their public finances to meet a lot of development goals. Um, and this transition and certain investment decisions are more costly to them than alternatives. 
And so I wouldn't necessarily put it as pressure, but I would put it as with the adequate level of support through relevant partnerships and with adequate um, engagement. So one of the things that we have seen very clearly, and speaking to what MEP Paul was just saying, you know, the way we have been f providing financial resources to our programs is one where we say upfront, this is what we are going to finance. So speaking of taxonomy, we say up front, this is what we will finance, this is what we will not finance. But we also say we don't want a project by project approach. We want to have all of the relevant partners at the table discussing with civil society organizations, indigenous people groups, women's organizations, private sector, discussing how should these resources be prioritized and how are we going to engage these different institutions in monitoring these in, and being part actually at times of the delivery of the investments. And that's how you, you ensure that you, know, you are prioritizing soundly the investments and, and that you have that you are ensuring the, the social outcomes and that you are ensuring this buy-in to the reforms as well and the support towards the reforms. I think support towards the reforms will be critical, you know, will be very critical. Your organization, you've got the EBRD, the World Bank, ADB. African are, Development are Bank. They, is that, how important is that to make sure that you do have this? Uh, it's very important approach. because some of the things that Amy Paul was also saying about, you know, labor conditions, um, you know, how, what is the treatment of labor and the which conditions are we allow, all, allowing certain practices, are we not? Those are things that the environmental and social standards of the multilateral development banks as part of their core due diligence of investment, of investing, that the, the multilateral development banks are obliged to look at. And so because we provide our finance through the multilateral development banks, um, we, we have a certain level of guarantee that certain standards are being looked at. But, you know, I do think that, and they have, you know, they have mechanisms for the communities to complain mm -hmm. in case, you know, they fear that these standards are not being adhered to. Yeah. Sorry, Paul. Yeah, pressure or partnership. Now, let's start with the financial mm. sector because the financial sector needs, really needs to make a change. And I hope and I expect the CIF to be one of the good examples. And the good examples are out there in the financial sector that sh the front runners that show the way, right? Uh, we show the way that you can invest in a way that's good for people and planet and still make a profit. Um, but you need to convince at one point or the other and you will not always convince everyone. So there was where legislation also came, yes. bringing the laggards up to the front runners. And that's how I see it. So yeah. legislation will be behind but will certainly follow. That uh, and I, like I see, I see good examples, but we need it on a wide scale. It should not be a corner in some institution that does well. No, no, it should be discussed on the board of that financial institution how they're going to make their investment work, not just for the shareholders, but for for us, for society. So that's where you see that the pressure will come in. Um, but also, in uh, if you look at uh, developing countries or middle-income countries, we fall from partnership to pressure at one point, if you take a bit of the longer run. We are not in a position to put pressure now because I don't think Europe is still in the lead. I think we're still at the start of our transformation. But it comes a point, of course, where we will apply pressure. Now we apply incentives, mm. uh, the carrot, not the stick. Mm. Uh, but there will come a point in time that it will not be just the carrot, but also the mm. stick. Um, the current, the new commission, I must say, will also look into the, uh, the point of car carbon border adjustment. Mm. Countries that do not sign up to the Paris Agreements won't have equal, uh, don't have equal access to the European market. It's, it's common sense, you don't want unfair competition on your own market, but it's also very much an incentive, a, a stick for the countries to make sure that they live up to the Paris Agreement. So we, we go from partnership, fine, but I know that if partnership doesn't work, it will lead to pressure as well. And it, it must lead, because we must make the transformation until to, uh, to 2050. And there are just a few years left. <laughs> yes, yeah. that's the, um, the real issue. You, apart from being on the Committee of Economic and Monetary yeah. Pressure, also on the US delegation yeah. of the, the Parliament. And we know the one person that who will not be attending COP25 is yeah, exactly. Donald J. Trump. So um, if you were introducing something like a border tax at some stage, do you, 
how do you think? I mean, we've seen a very bad reaction to a digital tax. Exactly. So <laughs> this is every uh, two weeks ago. I met some uh, representative uh, from from the U.S. Uh, also explaining the situation that we need to we need fair taxation and that mm. the reason was for the digital service tax. They understand that at that point. But of course, if you have the slogan "America First, uh, you will always say, "No, it's our right not to tax Google and Facebook." So that's what Donald Trump is doing right now, and that's a, that's. A, it's a, can you say this as a parliamentarian? It's a bloody shame. <laughs> I think you can, right? Uh, but this, this is, and this, but this is the, the world that Europe has to also to uh, to work in. But we have to be firm on our principles and on our ideals if we want to achieve a sustainable economy and society in 2050. Uh, we must we must stick to this. Uh, we we can't always be friendly. We can't give up our ideals and our hopes. So yeah, and that mean, but well, that's your point, of course, that you make. It would lead to a collision. Uh, we're on a collision course with the U.S. or the, the U.S. under Trump. That's for sure. I, I should say that Nancy Pelosi was at the conference was and was, uh, was a good deal more positive <laughs> and constructive really about the issue. Yeah. So uh, finally, um, we are going to see the, the end of hopefully some firm conclusions coming out of COP25. What would you like to see in terms of what you do? I mean, I, I, I think um, what I really want to see is next year COP26 ambitious NDCs that will take us to the 1.5 degree world. Right now we are not there. And so sound discussions, taking this opportunity to have sound discussions, including at the political level, on what is it that it will take to get to that point. Um, so that to me is... It would be a good outcome and some sense of a, a clear roadmap that you know from from the leaders there we understand that these countries are on the right track we understand that these countries are quite behind and these others are even further behind what is our plan to help them over the course of the next one year to come with more ambition in COP26 but I wanted to say just uh, that in your in terms of Europe I do think that you know there are wide, there, there are very um, large expectations of Europe right now. I'm an European citizen, but I have been living in outside of uh, Europe for uh, around 20 years, um, working in many developing countries. Now I'm based in the U.S. Um, and, and right now, you know, with the outcome of these recent elections in Europe and with this new uh, team in the European Commission, there are really big hopes that the European Union can play a significant leadership role internationally, not just domestically, but internationally. So my plea is that is for European Union to take on that. There's, there are big uh, exactly. expectations out there from the European Union. Uh, the, the, I would be happy yes. if, uh, if the, in the, at the COP countries will share the commitment to live up to the Paris Agreement and to continue, even though the US uh, has built. Uh, and then I want to see the initiative from the European Commission in the Ukraine deal. It will be presented in uh, the last uh, in, uh, the, la the last week, parliamentary week this year in Strasbourg. And this is, should be the very clear signal that Europe is taking the lead. Because uh, if you want to have this trans transformation, not just within Europe, but also outside Europe, let's say in Africa or Latin America, it's essential that Europe takes leadership, that we show the way. Like I said, like I said on the financial sector, we have front runners and lackers. It's very clear who the front runner in the world should be. That should be Europe. Paul, well, thank you very uh, much indeed. Mafalda, thank, thank you very you. much. Thank you.